Perfect. Thank you very much, Alik, for the for the kind introduction and of course for the opportunity to to give this lecture. So I will try to share my screen, hoping that you that you see this. Uh, can you see the title slide? It works. Yes. yes. Perfect. Very good. So then, uh, there we go. So as um, um, as Alik already mentioned, I will give a presentation, a lecture about seismology. And in particular, uh, I would like to talk about uh, solving large or larger seismic inverse problems, not just by increasing the power of our computers, but uh, by actually using smarter methods. And uh, the work that I will present, of course, hasn't been done all by myself, but it's a close collaboration with my colleagues Lars Gebrat, Dirk Philipp van Herbert, and Andrea Zonino, Servi Trasterson, Christian Böhm, and Martin van Drie. Uh, the central theme of this lecture is really the effort to constrain the structure of the Earth using earthquake data. And, uh, and since I think not all of you are seismologists, I would like to start with, um, with just a, a small introduction into, into this field. So those earthquake data are generated by earthquakes. And what you see here is a numerical simulation of such an earthquake. It's, uh, it's in fact a 2011 Tohoku earthquake. It had a magnitude of 9.1. And uh, literally within seconds, this earthquake radiated or liberated an energy of about four to the power of 22 joule. And uh, so this, this, this is an amount of energy that we can't imagine. And it corresponds to roughly 80 times the world energy consumption. So, so within, uh, within a few seconds, this earthquake liberated energy that would have covered the world energy consumption for about 80 years. So, so a very long time. Now this earthquake, of course, was, uh, was big enough to be recorded globally all around the earth. For example, at the, uh, at the Black Forest Observatory, which is located in Southern Germany. So, uh, so it's here at the position of the red star, and it has an epicentral distance from the earthquake of 83.3 degrees. So roughly a quarter around the Earth. And there at the Black Forest Observatory, one could observe these seismograms. So these seismograms are recordings of ground motion at that site. And you're looking here at the vertical component at the top, the east-west component in the middle, and the north-south component. And what you see is that those seismograms, that record, those recordings of ground motion roughly fall into two parts. We have that first part that contains waves of relatively low amplitude. These are the so-called body waves that literally travel through the volume of the Earth. We see here, for example, the first arriving P wave and, uh, and all sorts of other body waves arriving at different times, different P waves, different S waves, and so on and so forth. And then the later part of the seismogram is dominated by those high amplitude waves. These are surface waves that are bound to the surface of the Earth and, uh, and as a consequence have larger amplitudes. This is the kind of data that, uh, that we are looking at when we are trying to constrain the structure of the Earth, the deep structure of the Earth. Now a few words about the actual sources, which are those earthquakes. What you see to the left, what you see to the left is a collection or a visualization of the epicenters of about 22,000 earthquakes that have been located by the US Geological Service in 1998. So you see that, uh, that most of those earthquakes, this is well known, cluster around the, uh, the active boundaries of tectonic plates. There are lots of them, they, try to they, they like to repeat in, in nearly the same places. And, uh, and obviously they're poorly distributed. The, the bandwidth of those earthquakes, so the frequency content of those earthquakes, at least at a global scale, is very broad and, uh, and ranges from about 0.5 millihertz to around five hertz. So these are 13 octaves. So it's, it's a very broad frequency range. And of course, a priori, the position, the timing and the mechanism of those earthquakes are not known. And this has an important consequence for the inverse problem that we are trying to solve, because it is in fact a coupled source and structure problem. Both the source and the structure need to be constrained on the basis of those data. 
Now, what about the receivers that you are using? Those receivers are typically called seismometers. But they also come under, under different names and they are poorly distributed as well. What you see here is, uh, is actually the, the ray coverage or the station coverage of North America and the North Atlantic. So all the beach balls that you see are earthquakes and all the black triangles are seismic stations, seismometers that have been installed. And you see that uh, most of those seismometers are in rich industrialized countries, but there are very few in, for example, Africa, Eastern Europe, the Arctic, and of course, there are very few in the oceans. The few that you apparently see in the oceans are actually sitting on islands. So they are poorly distributed as well. They're very variable characteristics. So they have different recording bandwidths and they suffer from different kinds of side effects. And, uh, and the recording bandwidth actually quite often covers the observable bandwidth. So this, this is a quite nice feature. And currently I would say that the number of seismometers that are openly freely accessible at a global scale is on the order of about 10,000. This sounds a lot, but it actually isn't because of course the surface of the earth is very large and the distribu distribution is very heterogeneous. Now, what about the medium that we are interested in? We're interested in the, in the structure of the earth and, uh, and the earth is, uh, it's not a simple medium. In fact, it is, uh, it is viscoelastic and anisotropic. So it suffers from attenuation from the conversion of, uh, of kinetic energy into heat. The earth rotates, obviously, which complicates wave propagation and it, it is also self-gravitating. And uh, obviously also the earth has irregular topography. It has oceans and a fluid outer core. And those fluids part, fluid parts need to be accurately coupled to the solid parts of the earth. Of course, so this, this suggests, or it, it's evidence for the fact that the earth is a very complex medium. But when we solve an inverse problem, not all of this complexity may actually be relevant. So the necessary complexity really depends on the amount and type of data that we're interested in, but also on the aspect of earth structure that we would like to constrain. Most frequently in, in global seismic tomography, global seismic imaging, we are interested in the P velocity, so the velocity of compressional waves, but also in the velocities of SH and SV waves, which are shear waves with horizontal and vertical polarization. Now, traditionally, this, uh, this seismic tomography has been based on the measurement of travel times and on the measurement of rate theory. So what one would typically do, one would take such a recording here and then pick the arrival times of a bunch of waves. So for example, of those compressional waves or of those shear waves that are arriving here. And then one would try to build an earth model that explains those travel time observations as accurately as possible. Now, this is nice and good. It leads to a relatively simple and well-behaved inverse problem. But also, you evidently throw away a lot of the information that's actually available. And, uh, and as a consequence, during the past, I would say 10, 20 years, people have tried to improve this travel time tomography to what we loosely call full waveform inversion. And the goal of this full waveform inversion really is, so, so the ambition is to literally use every single wiggle of the seismogram that we have here and not just the travel times of a few of the waves. So here really the goal, the ambition, the dream is to exploit as much information as possible in order to improve resolution of deep earth structure but also to correctly account for the wave propagation physics in a complex three-dimensional earth in order to avoid forward modeling artifacts and in the other direction to correctly account for the finite frequency sensitivity and the non-linearity of the inverse problem in order to avoid inverse modeling artifacts. So where's the broader relevance of all of this? Um, as you are not all seismologists, you may wonder why is that, should that be interesting for you? The broader relevance of this, of this waveform inversion, of this full waveform inversion is that at much larger scales, at scales of, of about a million kilometers, you can use exactly the same methods in order to study the internal structure of the sun 
at, uh, at global scales, so about 10,000 kilometers, we would study the dynamics, evolution, and composition of the Earth. Then at, at slightly smaller scales, hundreds to 10,000 kilometers, those full waveform inversion models that we produce are relevant, important for earthquake source inversion, for reliable tsunami warnings, but also for the monitoring of the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. And if we go at e to even smaller scales, obviously the same methods can be used in exploration and reservoir geophysics for monitoring, for, in, for example, at even smaller scales of 10 to 100 meters in engineering applications. And then at the centimeter scale, there's technology transfer from seismic full waveform inversion to medical imaging, but also to non-destructive testing. And in fact, the figure that you see here, uh, the left part has 10 centimeter scale. This is a full waveform inversion image of a human breast. And uh, to the right, you see using the same color scale, a full waveform inversion image of the Earth. And of course, there are many others. So the interesting thing here is that, uh, that the methods that I will present, the technologies that I will present, they have relevance over about 11 orders of magnitude in spatial scale. So, but where are the challenges? And, uh, and really the outstanding challenge in what we are doing is that the computational cost of this full waveform inversion or FWI has a very poor scaling with frequency. So the scaling is somewhere between frequency to the power of four and frequency to the power of five. So at the moment, we are operating at frequencies that are relatively low because this is what we can afford computationally. But if we want to increase the frequency in order to actually cover the frequency range that we can observe, it rapidly becomes excessively expensive and totally out of scale. Now, of course, one may argue that there's Moore's law and so we just have to wait long enough. But you can make a little back of the envelope calculation. And, uh, and even if you assume that Moore's law continues to hold, which is a little bit questionable, it will actually take many decades before we can actually solve full waveform inversion problems, at least at global scale, within the bandwidth that we can actually observe that is down to about one hertz. So in other words, we will all be very old before we can actually solve this problem if we continue to do it the way we do now. Also as a consequence of this very poor frequency scaling, uncertainty quantification, so an honest comprehensive uncertainty quantification using, uh, using the Bayesian or the probabilistic approach is currently totally out of reach in full waveform. And that is unless we use frequencies that are so low that the exercise becomes useless or, or uninteresting. And so there is really a need to, to develop more clever algorithms and to not just wait until Moore's law helps us to solve the problem, which as I said, will take a very, very long time. So what are the goals of this lecture? Uh, they are in essence to present you with a collection of methods that enable faster 3D full waveform inversion. So faster, uh, but also a more complete and honest uncertainty quantification. And I will present you two classes of methods. The first one is more intelligent Monte Carlo samplers that allow us to do uncertainty quantification for interestingly large problems. And the second one is methods for accelerated forward and adjoint simulations. So simulations of wave propagation in forward and adjoint mode. So the outline of my talk is as follows. Um, I will start with so-called Hamiltonian null space shuttles. And, uh, and what these null space shuttles are, they are methods that use artificial Hamiltonian systems in order to produce alternative models of the Earth, alternative in the sense that they explain our observations as well as another model that we may already have found. And those Hamiltonian null space shuttles, they are the foundation or very closely related to a Monte Carlo method that I would like to present, which is, uh, which is called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And I will show you not only the theory behind Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but also an application to probabilistic full waveform inversion in two dimensions. 
and then we'll have a little break. I can't guarantee that this will be exactly after 45 minutes, but, but maybe roughly. But it's a, it's a natural break point in my presentation, so I would suggest to, to use that one. Then um, I want to introduce you to a strategy to, to tune those Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulations automatically. So those Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulations, they have a very large number of tuning parameters and you can try to tune them by hand. But in fact, you can develop more intelligent algorithms that tune this Monte Carlo sampler essentially while it's running, so on the fly. And, uh, and this is referred to as auto-tune. And then finally, I want to introduce a numerical method that we call smoothie stem, which is a variant of spectral element simulations of seismic wave propagation. And, uh, and these use numerical measures that are adapted to prior knowledge of the geometry of the wave field. And that, under favorable circumstances, allows us to reduce the computational cost of forward and adjoint wave field simulations by, by orders of magnitude. And then, of course, uh, I would be happy to have a discussion with all of you. Before I actually go uh, into the, the, the hard content, a few notes on the style of this presentation. Um, you're all connected virtually, and I guess after one and a half years or even more of pandemic, most of you are pretty tired of virtual lectures. And, uh, and so what you will see is a presentation that is rather colorful and casual. Uh, without hardcore mathematics, because I think um, um, th this is not suited for this kind of presentations. My focus will really be on transmitting concepts and not so much on transmitting rigorous math. So I really want to, to just whetten your appetite to get you interested and, uh, and maybe get you interested in, in having a more in-depth discussion or digging out some of the references that I will show at the, at the end. So here we go. The first topic, which is on Hamiltonian null space shadows. So first, a little bit about the preparation and the problem statement. What, what is this all about? What, what are the goals? And, uh, and the first thing I want to talk about, I need to talk about, is the notion of the, of the effective null space. So the setting is as follows. I imagine we have some misfit functional, chi, and that misfit functional measures the discrepancy, the difference between data that we have observed and data that we have computed for some model of the Earth. It need not be a seismological model. And of course, that misfit depends on M, which is a certain model of the Earth. It can be a distribution of the P wave speed and S wave speed in the Earth, or of some electrical or magnetic properties, and so on and so forth. And we assume that we have already found a model of the Earth that we call M hat, a model of the Earth that we actually find acceptable. So that explains our observations to within the observational errors. So we have an acceptable model and we don't bother at the moment where that acceptable model is actually coming from. And now the effective null space is the collection of all other models, M hat, plus some delta M, so our model that we already have, plus some perturbations that have, that produce a misfit, so a discrepancy between observations and synthetics that is smaller or equal to the misfit of the acceptable model that we already found, plus some epsilon, which is a misfit tolerance. And so we want to find alternative models that produce a misfit that is smaller than the one that we already found, plus possibly some little tolerance that we admit because we have observational uncertainties. And uh, so all, all of those models, those M plus delta M, those, these are the alternative models that we are after. And all of those alternative models, they constitute our effective null space. So now the problem is, of course, how do we actually find those alternative models? How do we find those M hat plus delta M that explain our observations equally well. How do we do this? Why is this actually relevant? Why are, are we interested in that question? Well, obviously, this is important for uncertainty analysis. We want to know if there are alternative models that explain our data equally well, but that are potentially very different from the acceptable model that we have already found. Right? And if we find models that are very different from the one that we already have, 
it means that our inferences that we are making are pretty uncertain. But also, we may use this in a constructive mode. We may want to construct alternative models that explain our data equally well, but maybe contain some new structural feature that we want to test. So how does this Hamiltonian model space shuttle actually work? What is the, what is the essence behind it? So that, there's a trick. It's a mathematical trick. And, uh, and here comes part one of this. So what we do is we interpret any model M as the position of a space shuttle or some particle in a high dimension. So if we have an n-dimensional model space, say a thousand dimensional model space, then we interpret any model M as the position in a 1000 dimensional space. And then what we do, and at this point, this may seem a little bit weird, we assign a potential energy to that particle, or to that space shuttle. And we call that potential energy U. It depends on the position of the particle, which is M. And we simply say that this potential energy is equal, equal to the misfit of that model. So potential energy is equal to misfit. And we can do that because misfit is always a positive quantity. And so we ensure that uh, potential energy is positive. And then we also assign an artificial momentum. So this momentum P is totally invented. It's an, it's an auxiliary variable. At the moment, it's just some vector. And based on this artificial momentum, we can come up with an artificial kinetic energy K. So K, the kinetic energy, depends on the momentum. And it is defined just as in classical mechanics as one half of the momentum transposed times the inverse of the mass times the momentum. And here, what is important is that inverse of the mass is actually the mass matrix. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a generalization of the scalar mass that we are used to. And so now we have, we have invented a potential energy and we have invented a kinetic energy. And, uh, and then we say that uh, we have some initial momentum. So just imagine that that, that space shuttle is sitting in, its, uh, in, in a certain position M. And then we say at that position, it has not only uh, an initial potential energy, but it has an initial momentum. And we say that this initial momentum is chosen such that the kinetic energy corresponding to that initial momentum p hand is just equal to our misfit tolerance. But this is this epsilon that we had before. So if we go back, so here we have our little misfit tolerance over here. And we say that we choose the initial momentum such that the initial kinetic energy is just equal to that tolerance. Well, now we have invented uh, potential energy and the kinetic energy. We can add both, and this gives us the total energy, which in classical mechanics typically is called the Hamiltonian. So that's part one of the trick, inventing essentially a couple of quantities. Now, part two is letting this space shuttle actually fly through model space. So we have the total energy, H, and, uh, and we can then compute a trajectory of that space shuttle, of that, of that space shuttle, by solving Hamilton's equations from classic, classical mechanics. I'm sure most of you have seen those. The, the, the time derivative of the position of our model is equal to the momentum derivative of the total energy. This is the first of Hamilton's equations. And the second Hamilton equation is that the time derivative of the momentum is equal to minus the space derivative of the Hamilton. But then we can, we can solve those equations. And we know that H is actually constant along a trajectory. So H, the total energy, does not change as the space shuttle flies through more space. Now let's see what this implies. So we have here the total energy H after some time T. So the total energy depends on position and momentum, which in turn depend on time. And the total energy is equal to the potential energy, which we define to be equal to the misfit 
as a function of position, as a function of model, plus the kinetic energy, which as we have seen before, is one half momentum transposed times the inverse of the mass matrix times the momentum. Let's carry this a little bit further. Then we know that H, the total energy is preserved. This means that the total energy after some time T must be equal to the total energy at the beginning of the trajectory. So at the initial position of the null spatial. And this initial total energy is equal to the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy. And then remember, we cross out a few terms. This initial potential energy, we define to be equal to the misfit tolerance. And so then we have this equation here, just crossing out a few terms that are not so interesting anymore. And then what we see is that since epsilon is, a, no, since, uh, let's, let's, let's go here. This kinetic energy here is a positive quantity. So the kinetic energy as a function of time is always positive. And if we take this into account, we find that our misfit as a function of time is smaller or equal than the misfit at the initial position plus our little tolerance. And this is exactly what we wanted. So this means as this space shuttle flies through model space, it produces misfits that are always smaller or equal than the initial misfit at the initial position plus that little tolerance. So this means that all models along that trajectory are indeed within the effective null space. So this is exactly what we wanted. So what does this look like in practice? Um, it is important to note that depending on some choices that we make, some subjective choices, this space shuttle probes different parts of the null space. For example, if we say that our tolerance epsilon, so if epsilon is, if this is zero, then we can actually show that this null space shuttle is equal, equal to a gradient descent method. And the different types of descent methods that we have, for example, conjugate gradients or Newton methods or steepest descent, they depend on the kind of mass matrix. So the null space shuttle that I just presented is a generalization of gradient descent methods. We can also prescribe the takeoff direction of the null space shuttle. I, I won't show this here. And this corresponds to adding specific features to the model after it has been constructed. And what we can also do by different choices of the mass matrix is to probe either rougher or smoother parts of the null space. So here comes an example. And that example is from a nonlinear travel time topography. So at the bottom, we have receivers. Uh, 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 sources, so these are explosions or earthquakes. And the waves from those earthquakes are recorded by some receivers that you see here on top. So these are seismometers. And, uh, and what we did here is, uh, is we reconstructed a tomographic image that you see here in color. And that tomographic image, which is the seismic wave speed in kilometer per second, already explains our observations to within the uncertainties. So this is our initial model. This is an, an initial model that we already like. And then we add some initial momentum, p hat. And this initial momentum is just this little blob that you see here. And then we, we let that null space shuttle fly. And after four artificial seconds, which corresponds to 500 iterations, we see that the initial model here has changed to this model. And by construction, this alternative model that we obtain after four seconds explains the observations equally well to within the uncertainties. So we have constructed an alternative model. And in fact, during this iteration, we have constructed 500 alternative models, but of course I can't show all of them. Now, the, uh, what you see here in, uh, below is, uh, is a diagram of the evolution of the different energies. So we have the initial kinetic energy that is sitting here. The initial potential energy, which is the initial misfit, it's plotted here in green. And the total energy in blue is the Hamiltonians. 
That's what you see here. And then by construction, as this null space shuttle flies, the, uh, the total energy in blue remains constant, what you see here. The uh, misfit or the potential energy increases a little bit, but it still remains below the threshold that we have set by construction. And then you can keep this running and you see that then along this trajectory, the uh, potential energy or the misfit fluctuates, but it always remains below the tolerance. And then as this null space shuttle flies, we produce lots of alternative models. So this one after four seconds, this one after 24 seconds, after 48 seconds, and so on and so forth. But this can also be shown in the form of a movie, this is here. So every little snapshot that you see in this movie is an alternative tomographic model that explains the observations just as well as the model that you have seen at the beginning. And so you have a mechanism to produce literally uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of alternative models. So the point here is, so some preliminary conclusions, the point is that we can explore the efficient null space of even of this nonlinear inverse problem and produce alternative models without Monte Carlo sampling. So it's a lot more efficient than Monte Carlo sampling. The whole thing rests on the somewhat counterintuitive construction of an artificial Hamiltonian system, where the data misfit corresponds to the potential energy and the misfit tolerance that we admit corresponds to the kinetic energy. We have, or I have explained that this is a hybrid between gradient descent and Monte Carlo methods. In fact, if the tolerance, this misfit tolerance epsilon is zero, then this null space shuttle becomes a gradient descent method. And what you will see then in the next chapter is that if we draw those random momenta repeatedly in a random fashion, then we end up with an algorithm that is called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, we have different user-defined modes of operation of this null space shuttle. And, like, and, and with the help of this, we can do quantitative hypothesis testing. We can construct alternative models with specific features that we would like to see but we can also produce alternative models that are either smooth or rough. So there's a, there's a lot of potential to, to play with that method and to use it in a way that is useful for a specific application. Now let's continue to the, to the next chapter, which is uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and specifically applied to seismic tomography. Uh, for those you, who, who, don't, uh, who haven't seen this picture, what you see here on this slide is the it's the Monte Carlo Casino, uh, after which Monte Carlo methods have been, have been named. So what is the motivation of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo? Um, it's really the, the efficient sampling of, of model space. And this can be exemplified with a, with, a, with a toy example. So this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method, it was introduced as, as hybrid Monte Carlo, so under a different name in quantum mechanics in 1987 but it took a surprisingly long time. So really uh, about three decades before it actually leaked into, into geophysics. It's a random walk method that allows us to sample the posterior probability distribution of an inverse problem. And, uh, and the motivation in essence is a well-known deficiency of the metropolis Hastings algorithm. And I want to illustrate this deficiency here. So assume we have a probability density, it's just two dimensional that is, that is shown here. And we want to explore this two dimensional probability density using, using Metropolis Hastings. Um, essentially, we have two choices. So we can make small steps, baby steps through model space. This has the advantage that almost all of the steps will be accepted. But on the other hand, our exploration of model space is very, very slow. Now then, in order to accelerate model space exploration, one may think that we can do just bigger steps as shown in this diagram. But uh, if we do bigger steps, then the likelihood that the next model is actually accepted in this metropolis Hastings algorithm becomes very low. And so as a consequence, um, in the end, we also explore very slowly because our acceptance rate is so slow, is so low. 
So Hamilton Monte Carlo tries to fix this problem by basically taking advantage of derivative information. And, uh, and this allows Hamilton and Monte Carlo to make both long distance moves and have a high acceptance rate. And, and this is exactly the combination of properties that we need in order to solve high dimensional inverse problems as we typically encounter in geophysics. So in conceptual introduction to Hamilton and Monte Carlo, which in principle you have already seen in the previous chapter. It's a, it's a variant of this Hamiltonian null space shuttle. We start with an initial model M. In the null space shuttle, we have chosen this deterministically. It was a model that we already liked, that we already found acceptable. Now in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, the initial model is chosen randomly. So say it's, it's sitting up here. And uh, then we have a misfit. And we say that this misfit is the potential energy of that initial model. So the same strategy here, we have a misfit and we now simply say that we call this misfit the potential energy. For our brain, we may say that this initial model is, uh, is the position of a high dimensional space shuttle. And that space shuttle orbits around a planet, which, is, uh, which corresponds to the maximum likelihood model. And then we assign a random momentum to that space shuttle, which means that we kick the space shuttle in this direction. As before, as in the Hamiltonian non space shuttle, this is a totally auxiliary quantity. And this initial momentum then defines the kinetic energy of the space shuttle. Then we solve Hamilton's equations. So Hamilton's equations then let the space shuttle move along a trajectory through this high dimensional space, which is our model space. And, uh, and as this null space shuttle, the space shuttle flies, it preserves its total energy. So we move towards a new test model. And then just as or similar to the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, we evaluate a Metropolis rule. If this move to this test model is rejected, we go back to where we came from. And otherwise, we move on. So moving on means we again kick the space shuttle in a random direction by giving it a random momentum. And then it flies off in a different direction. And then I see, I think you see where this is going. It just flies from one position to another and so on and so forth and traverses model space. What are the important features of this algorithm? The first one is that all those trajectories always orbit around plausible models. In, in, in simple words, the, uh, the space shuttle always stays near, near the Earth, or we, if, if you use a, a different picture, the Earth always stays around the sun, near the sun. And this is what enables long distance moves. And right? so we, we move along very long trajectories but all of those trajectories are still close to the maximum likelihood model. And so, so they're still very likely to actually be useful, to be meaningful. So we, have, we can have long distance moves. And as a consequence, we have fast model space exploration. We can move fast and those long moves, uh, we can move a long way and those long distance moves are actually being accepted with a high probability. A disadvantage may be that we actually require derivatives of the forward problem. So derivatives of the, uh, of the potential energy with respect to our model parameters, because this derivative is needed in the solution of Hamilton's equations. But in fact, it turns out that this is a very small disadvantage because we can compute those derivatives very efficiently using the joint techniques. That's so pretty doable. So uh, towards applications, how is this useful? And, uh, and what I want to show you is an application or synthetic application of this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo to full waveform inversion in two dimensions. Just a small example here. We use two demand, 2D elastic wave propagation. Behind that, this is classical staggered grid finite difference method with a maximum frequency of 50 Hertz. We're interested in three physical model parameters P velocity, S velocity, and density. And we discretize our model using 10,800 grid points. 
So this means that the total model space dimension is 32,400, which is actually pretty large for a Monte Carlo method. It is synthetic. So we are uh, using a synthetic model, a constructed model in order to produce artificial data. And here you see uh, aspects of this model. On top, this is the distribution of S velocity. So it's in a, in a box that is 250 meters wide and 125 meters deep. And, uh, and you see this, this sort of mimic of a geological structure. All the sources are here at the bottom and all the black triangles near the top, near the surface are the other receivers. And below you see the distribution of density that we put in. And then using this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampler, we can produce many aspects of, uh, of the posterior distribution. For example, the mean value of S velocity. And this mean value, which of course would not be the only uh, statistics that you, look, that you would look at, uh, very closely reproduces the, uh, the target model that we plug in. And, uh, and something similar is true for, for density, but of course density classically can be, um, uh, can be re reconstructed only much more poorly. And, uh, and what we also obtain are quantifiers of, of uncertainty. So for example, here, the standard deviation of S velocity or the standard deviation of density. And so, so this is very nice, especially the density part, because as I said, density classically is extremely difficult to reconstruct. The reconstruction here, of course, is not perfect, but at least it is honest and we get an honest quantification of uncertainty. So also here, some preliminary conclusions before we, we go into the break. This Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method is a randomized version of the Hamiltonian null space shuttle, where you successively draw random momenta. So you kick the, the space shuttle randomly in different directions. What we have seen is that we can treat order of magnitude 10,000 model parameters in a two-dimensional full waveform inversion and that without any supercomputing. So we can solve a meaningful full waveform inversion problem probabilistically in a Bayesian way without requiring a supercomputer. So the, the example that you have seen before ran on the laptop within a couple of days. And so it is comparatively cheap. And what we obtain are not only estimates of the parameters, but also honest estimates of the uncertainties in those parameters. And that includes estimates of density, which is very important from a, from a geophysical perspective. And those uncertainty estimates, and that's also important here, are free from any bias that would come from subjective regularizations of the inverse problem. Now, why does it work so well? Why is it interesting for geophysics? And that interest really comes from the computational cost needed to generate an independent sample. So an independent model of the earth. Now in Metropolis Hastings, which has been developed many decades ago, this scales as the power of n squared. Uh, this scales as n squared. So when n is the number of model parameters, then the number of samples of Monte Carlo samples that you need to draw before you actually see a new independent model scales as n to the power of two. And this means that with Metropolis Hastings, you cannot solve high dimensional geophysical inverse problems simply because the number of samples that you would need to produce grows extremely fast. In contrast, for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, the scaling is much more favorable. The scaling is approximately n to the power of five over four. So it is almost, not quite, but almost a linear scaling. And the scaling property is what makes Hamiltonian Monte Carlo so well suited for high dimensional geophysical inverse problems. So this is the, the point here. Now what you see, what you will see in the next chapter after the break is really uh, more in depth about the generation of those, of those independent samples. How can we even accelerate this? And how can we optimize the, uh, the generation of those, uh, of those independent samples? And, uh, and as I said, this will come after the break, which I think is, uh, is about 10 minutes.
And, uh, and this will then be about this topic about auto-tuning Hamiltonian Monte Carlo.